If you lose your internet connection or have to restart your computer, you can rejoin the session using the URL that was sent to you in your registration email. To have a smooth experience while tuning in, we recommend using Google Chrome if you're using an internet browser. If at any point you feel that the presentation is too quiet, try one of the following tips to resolve the issue. Each webinar is aimed to take questions from you, our audience. So let's take a look at how you can interact with our presenters. If you have a question you want to bring into the discussion, you can type it out in the questions panel. When you're ready, hit send and we'll be notified of your question. Once we receive your question, we'll do our best to integrate it into the conversation. Just note that though we do our best to hear from each of you, it may be a busy discussion and we won't be able to get to everyone's questions. The Sikh Research Institute's mission is to provide educational resources to Sikhs to lead a guru-inspired life. As a global, non-for-profit organization, we produce original online courses, research papers, videos, podcasts, events, and books to create the richest source of Sikh knowledge online. We hope you enjoyed this session, and if you would like to watch it again, or would like to show a friend the webinar, most of our sessions are recorded and put up on our YouTube channel. Thank you for joining today's webinar hosted by the Sick Research Institute. This webinar will begin with a 40 minute moderated discussion between our presenters, after which we will have 40 minutes of Q&A from the audience. So please drop your questions in the chat box and be sure to include your name and city. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters. Gori Gill earned a BFA in Applied Art from the College of Art in New Delhi, a BFA in Photography from Parsons School of Design slash the New School in New York, and an MFA in Art from Stanford University, California. She's exhibited within India and internationally. Her work is in the collections of prominent institutions worldwide, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Tate Museum, London, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, and Photo Museum in Winterhur. In 2011, she was awarded the Grange Prize, Canada's foremost award for photography. Working in both black and white and color, Gill addresses the Indian identity markers of caste, class, and community as determinants of mobility and social behavior. In her work, there is empathy, surprise, and a human concern over issues of survival. Sarpreet Singh is a Boston-based writer, podcaster, and commentator. His newest book, The Story of the Six, 1469 to 1708, a retelling of Sikh history, was published in June 2021 by Penguin Random House. He's the author of the critically acclaimed Night of the Restless Spirits, a collection of short fiction about 1984, and the best-selling The Camel Merchant of Philadelphia. He's also the writer-narrator of the Story of the Six podcast, which has listeners in over 90 countries, and is the founder of the Gurmit Sangeet Project. Dr. Shruti Devgan is a visiting assistant professor of sociology at Bowdoin College. Her research focuses on the diasporic, intergenerational, and digital memories of the 1984 anti sikh violence. Dr. Devgan is part of the editorial team at the Sikh Research Journal, run under the aegis of the Sikh Foundation. She's especially interested in bridging the gap between academia and wider audiences and has written for platforms such as Context, which is the American Sociological Association's journal for general readers, and NYU's web journal, uh, The Revealer. And lastly, we have the Sing Twins. Uh, the Sing Twins are contemporary British artists with an international reputation, widely known for their highly detailed, narrative, symbolic, and eclectic style rooted in Indian aesthetics. Describing their work as postmodern, the twins engage with social, political, and cultural issues that often explore hidden narratives of colonial history and its legacies. 
Their contribution to art and as pioneers in the modern development of ancient and Indian miniature painting has been recognized at the highest level. In 2010, they were made honorary citizens of their home city of Liverpool, and in 2011 were each awarded MBEs by Queen Elizabeth I. Um, they are, have subsequently each been awarded three honorary doctorates for their outstanding contribution to British art, services to the Indian miniature tradition, and most recently for promoting diversity in the arts. I'll pass it on to Dr. Shikizevgan to get our conversation started. Thanks so much, Manvinder, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'm grateful to Inikor, the creative director of Sikri, for uh, inviting me to moderate this panel and for the staff at Sikri, of course, for organizing it. And many thanks, of course, to our wonderfully accomplished panelists for taking the time to join us today and for their significant work in several areas, uh, including, of course, 1984, which is the theme for today's discussion. So 37 years ago uh, this week, Sikhs suffered in the genocidal violence organized by the Indian state in Delhi and other parts of India. And the events of 1984, both the attack on the Darbar Sub in June uh, and the no uh, October-November massacre, initiated at least a decade of extrajudicial killings, disappearances, atrocities and torture in Punjab. 1984 became a taboo subject for sex in India as the state and mass media constructed a narrative to blame, shame, and stigmatize the community. But since at least the early 2000s, an intergenerational cohort of transnational sex are looking for ways to talk back to this dominant narrative, and they're finding ways to tell the story of 1984 in their own words. And we see this represented in our panel today. You know, we have a transnational uh, group right here. So Ms. Gill joins us from India, the Singh twins from the UK, and Mr. Singh from the US. So scholars of trauma tell us that individuals and groups don't fully experience traumatic events. Instead, they can uh, be experienced only after uh, the event and even then remain elusive. But as sociologist Molly Andrews writes, even if language is insufficient for the task, it is, if not all we have, at least one of the most effective tools we have for communicating that which must not be forgotten. And language here means not just the written and spoken word, but also non-narrative forms of representation, which we'll be talking about today. Um, our panelists, of course, are doing this work of representing and remembering trauma and suffering through art, literature, and photography, and in the process, devising a language for extreme suffering. And while they're using different media and modes of remembering 1984, they're all grappling with this common question of representing and translating violence and trauma. And in doing my own research on 1984, I found our panelists' work evocative, uh, moving, generative, and thought-provoking. And I'm eager to talk to them about their own journey and process and the media they use in finding a language for the unspeakable. Uh, before we begin, just a quick note on the format. Uh, I think Manvinder did go over it. Uh, I'll start by asking our panelists a series of questions. And in the time left, I'll open the floor for audience Q&A. Uh, my apologies in advance if you're not able to address all your questions uh, during the webinar, but please go ahead and share anything that comes to mind and we'll try to address this later over email. Uh, we'll try to offer some answers. So I'm going to start with my questions and I'd like to start by asking our panelists uh, about their own encounter with 1984. So Ms. Gill, if you can please start with you, when and how did you first discover the events of 1984? Uh, thank you so much, Shruti, and uh, wonderful to be here. Um, so 1984, you know, I was a 14-year-old in school at that time, in boarding school in Kasoli. And uh, my memory, my personal memory was of, as children, classes were closed, and we were all, you know, made to watch uh, the kind of funeral of Indira Gandhi which was playing, you know, her lying in, uh, in, uh, in state and then the funeral and all of that. We were quite isolated from other things that were going on, uh, you know, but shortly thereafter, I heard my parents who were in Africa at that time, living in Nigeria, uh, you know, my father, I heard, you know, um, um, that in the days that followed, 
his cousin, his first cousin, his Bua's son, who was actually a major in the army and who was at that point visiting his in-laws in Delhi, you know, came out of the house wearing his uniform, thinking that would protect him. And uh, the crowd actually that was at the gate got him first, you know. And uh, so, so this was a kind of, you know, obviously shook the family and a huge personal loss, uh, which I didn't fully understand as a child. You know, um, many years later, when I was uh, actually uh, 2005, I was asked by Tehelka to, uh, to go in, you know, after the Nanavati Commission report, I was asked to go in along with Hartosh Bal, who was the political editor. He's now political editor at Caravan, very fine journalist. And they said, will you go into, uh, you know, widow's colony, and Tilak Vihar, where a lot of the survivors, the widows are living. And will you make a photo essay? And at that time, Tehelka was a kind of broadsheet, you know, and they said, we will run it as a double spread, just as a photo, you know, which people can actually remove and use even as a poster or every week. And so I went in and suddenly I came face to face with people's suffering and stories, which, of course, you know, really shook me because those four weeks, you know, to hear people tell, uh, you know, their own uh, actual experience. And, you know, I've called the essay in, in, in the notebooks I, I subsequently made. The essay is called Jistan Lage Soi Jane because ultimately, of course, it's the people who experience something who, who know what that feels like, you know. So, that was my very f powerful, uh, you know, first encounter, which stayed with me. At that point, it was in uh, only published in Tehelka. But four years later, 2009, Outlook asked me to go and do something for the 30th anniversary, uh, 25th anniversary. So I went again. And then in 2014, I was asked, you know, to uh, to to do something. Uh, there was a the Bombay Photo Festival. And they said, we are doing something on cities. And I said, actually, I want to speak about the kind of subterranean violence that exists in our cities and that lies just beneath the surface and can erupt. And, you know, and, and that often uh, is not answered for, you know. And so then that was the genesis uh, of the notebook, which, you know, I, I mean, I'm giving, I'm sort of like, I guess one thing led to another, but just to say that, you know, the stories that I, I encountered in 2005 did not leave me and are still with me and have led to this kind of growing archive, um, you know, of work. So that's... Thank you so much. Yeah. And it's uh, uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at Ms. Gill's really powerful uh, work, it's freely available and accessible online. And uh, I believe the links to her work are available in chat. Um, uh, it's it's a really evocative, uh, layered project with a mix of pictures and essays and poems. Uh, and thanks so much for uh, sharing your story, Ms. Gill. And uh, really sorry for your loss as well. Um, Sing, uh, Sing Twins, can I ask you the same question, please? So when and how did you first discover the events of 1984? Well, like Goli, we were at school at the time 1984 happened. And um, really, it was just through the news. Like m most people living outside of India, we didn't have that physical, you know, face-to-face uh, -face experience that a lot of other people had. And uh, I think um, our earliest memories, if you like, of, of the news and what happened at that time was going into school and having to face our school friends who suddenly were telling us that you know all you know six were terrorists and we're, we're basically kind of uh, feeding upon the the propaganda um, that was coming through the most of the media that was, was basically depicting this as, as some kind of uh, uh, action on behalf of the government to save the six from their own folly if you like through the so-called terrorists that were in, embedded in, in the temple. So, you know, our earliest memories are trying to really argue with our school friends to, to tell them that, no, you know, we're not all terrorists and trying to explain to them, you know, the kind of the, the history of uh, uh, the events and, and how the Sikhs felt about it from their perspective. 
Yeah, I think it wasn't until quite a good few years after that that we began to learn the context of uh, uh, what had happened uh, in terms of the attack on Hermann Saab and some of the reports that were coming out of India, you know, being filtered through because there was still a lot of, um, you know, blacking of the media and, and propaganda being banded around for many years, as you'll, as you'll all know. Um, so gleaming whatever information we could about that event to try and build a bigger picture, you know, living so many thousands of miles away, it was quite difficult, but somehow we felt very emotionally connected to that story. Um, and really that's what inspired our, our initial artwork about this event. I, I, I don't know if you wanted us to share that at this stage or later on in the conversation, but um, you know, it, it, it was quite a simple connection really, something that happened li literally overnight through one news news item on the television, but something that didn't quite add up. It didn't seem to cover all, all the pieces of the puzzle and that left us very frustrated and annoyed. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, we'll get to your iconic uh, painting in just a bit. Um, uh, I'll have you just try to talk us through some aspects of it and we'll get to that. But thanks so much for sharing your story. And it's just remarkable how the narrative of sex as terrorists, how soon uh, it sort of circulated and found mm -hmm. its way, uh, you know, thousands of miles away, like you're saying. Mm -hmm but also your transnational engagement with it. That's that's in, that's remarkable as well. I mean, that's one of the uh, most remarkable aspects of 1980 or representing 1984, especially, uh, you know, how transnational Sikhs have been able to uh, sort of reclaim the narrative and start telling their stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mr. Singh is part of the uh, diaspora as well and has um, done great work on 1984. And so, Mr. Singh, I'm going to ask you the same question about your first encounter. How did you discover the events of 1984? Of course. So I was at engineering school in Pilani, Rajasthan, which is several hours away from Delhi during the events of October 1984. And while there were a few disturbances on campus, uh, there was really nothing very significant that happened. It's important to understand that there was a certain narrative that was in place, which was ubiquitous and you know, persistent and carefully crafted, which essentially said that a beloved prime minister was assassinated by her Sikh bodyguards. And then in retaliation, a regrettable but spontaneous uh, orgy of violence descended upon the Sikhs of Delhi. It was really nobody's fault. Uh, you know, it just so happened that people were very upset, so Sikhs were attacked. Mm. Well, I bought into that narrative, like most other Indians. I visited Delhi, I used to pass through Delhi on my way home, and I heard these disquieting stories from relatives you know, certain cousins who used to have turbans on their heads didn't have them anymore. And what I heard was, well, there was a huge disturbance in Delhi, we were unsafe, and you know, we decided to give up our identity to survive. And that was pretty much the extent of it at that time. It wasn't until I left a couple of years later to go to the US for grad school when, as I was grappling with very personal issues of identity and, uh, you know, dealing with my issues by delving into Sikh history for the first time in my life in an attempt to understand what underpinned the identity, that's when somewhat serendipitously my engagement with 1984 started in earnest. And this was through certain writings that I discovered that I had access to in the US that I had not been able to access and honestly hadn't even tried to access when I was in India. So I'll talk about some of the most notable ones. Uh, the first was a slim booklet that I'm sure all of you and a lot of your audience is now very aware of. It was a report titled, Who are the Guilty? It was called The Black Book because it literally had a black cover. It had been produced by two very credible human rights organizations in India, the PCL and the PUDR. And in sharp contrast to the official narrative that I had bought into, it seemed to suggest that what had happened in Delhi 
was not a spontaneous riot as it was uh, cast as, but really an organized pogrom. And what struck me at that time was the specificity of the report. You know, they have, the writers had done, uh, the creators of the report had done their homework, there were interviews, there were names, there were times, places. I wasn't completely convinced. And then I discovered a reprint of an article written by Ms. Madhu Kishwar in Manushi. In sharp contrast to most of her media colleagues, she had fearlessly reported about what had happened in Delhi. And to my shock, everything that she wrote in her article seemed to match the PUCLPUDR reports that I had read. So now I had two sources that seemed unimpeachable, both non-sick, which suggested to me that what had happened was very different from what I thought had happened. To give you the short version, my next engagement was with a paper written by Dr. Veena Das, who was in Delhi uh, during 1984 and during the aftermath. She had visited Philip Bihar, the so-called widow colony, and she had studied a group of children in particular, she observed them at play and uh, tried to understand how they dealt with their PTSD. And she wrote about two children in particular in her paper. One of them was a young man whose name was Avtar. He was deaf and mute, and uh, he had been a boy during the young boy at the time of the events. His father had been lynched before his eyes, and being deaf and mute, the only way this child could articulate his trauma was by acting out what had happened to his father with his hands and his body. And then there was the story of this other young girl whose father was doused with kerosene oil and set alight. And this little child would not let go her father's hand until the last breath left his body. And Dr. Das documented that the mob was ashamed because they didn't want to hurt a young child, but when they tried to pull the child away, she seemed to acquire superhuman strength almost, and they couldn't pry her away from her father, and her hand was horribly burned. It was reading you know, these reports, and in particular, Dr. Das's work, that created you know, sort of in the backdrop of my research into history, it created a certain kind of turmoil in my heart, which poured out in the form of a poem or a story in verse called Kupar's Mind, which is the last piece in my book, Night of the Rest of Spirits. And then I remember I had come to hear about the massacre at the Dulkhnevar and Gurdwara out in Patiala, which I was not aware of because everybody knew that the Sri Hermandar Sad had been attacked. But at that time, Nobody knew about Operation Woodrose, in which 40 other Gurdwaras had been attacked simultaneously. And you know, then I wrote the title story at that time, Night of the Rest of Spirits, that sort of tries to place the violence of 1984 in the context of the long history of conflict that the Punjab has seen, you know, from ancient times to Jalayamala Bagh and modern times. So that was the genesis of uh, Night of the Rest of Spirits. Uh, so that was the beginning of my engagement with 1984, which started in the early 90s uh, when I was a young man in the US uh, you know, at grad school. Thank you so much. Right. And, and there's just so much that comes out in your story, Mr. Singh. I mean, the politics of storytelling and the significance of representation, how the state and mass media at the time constructed the, this narrative. Was, but also, like Ms. Gill was saying earlier, there was media blackout. Media played such an important part in sort of constructing uh, the notion of 1984 and the idea of what the Sikh community was all about, especially at the time. And all your work, I mean, the, the various you know ways in which you're representing 1984, they're all 
you know, acts of subversion, acts of resistance. Um, and it's it's so important that you're doing this work. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to know, uh, and you've all talked about your work a little bit, but I'd love to know a little bit more about it. So maybe you can briefly walk us through some important aspects of your project. And I believe that um, we'll be able to do a screen share at this time. And um, Mr. Singh, if there is any, uh, if maybe you want to read a small section from one of your short stories or just talk about it, that'll be great. But we can start with Ms. Gill again. So, uh, you know, if, if we can uh, share the screen and show some of the um, images from Ms. Gill's notebooks on 1984, and, uh, and then you can, you know, sort of keep talking as we are showing those images. Thank you, Shruti. So um, as I was explaining, you know, the the genesis of these notebooks was in uh, originally, of course, going back to 2005, when I first went to Tilak Vihar, Widow's Colony, uh, then again in 2009, and then in 2014, I was asked to be part of this festival. And so I decided to, um, you know, speak of this kind of violence, you know, and I wanted to, again, somehow, you know, basically those voices didn't leave me, you know, and those stories didn't leave me and I didn't know how to address it. And so I started to think, you know, I, I also am always interested in how photographs function in so many different ways, right? And they circulate as well in different ways and they are read by people uh, very differently. So. Uh, so what I thought, I also was disturbed by the fact that as someone who's lived in Delhi or, you know, lived in India pretty much all my life, except for five years in the U.S., uh, I am in Delhi for a good chunk of it. I felt I hadn't had the 84 conversation with my friends, you know, in Delhi. And I wanted to have this conversation uh, and not with not just six, but with artist friends who were from other, you know, Hindus or whatever, any other religion or atheist or whatever, but my community, you know. So really for me, the, the question was, how do we have this conversation? And instead of burying it, why do we not speak about it? And, you know, how do we, and as artists, how do we speak about it, you know? So I just did something very simple. I took the images that I had taken in Tilak Vihar and later in, you know, in Gari and in Tilok Puri. And I made, you know, a set of about 30 friends, uh, you know, an image each. And I said, would you like to say something about ED4? And, uh, you know, that was about it. But of course, uh, in that list of people, I... I, I actually left out, you know, uh, academics and activists and uh, lawyers because, in a way, they have, a, 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 you know, a, a standpoint, like, and they have a way to express and, you know, channel uh, uh, their thoughts. But I was looking for something also that was perhaps more emotional, ambiguous, you know, coming from a different space, as it were. I mean, in my mind, you know, I, I would think of Toba Teik Singh, you know, or of Manto and how perhaps the truest, some of the truest words, you know, of uh, on partition were said by that madman, you know, in the story of Toba Teik Singh. So to me, I was just looking for really personal responses, you know, from friends who were poets, filmmakers, you know, you see here Anusha Rizvi on the screen. Uh, who made people live, many of whom who had not till that point spoken about ET4. Uh, I was very moved, you know, to find that almost everyone, bar one, one person who said that he couldn't respond because he was still thinking about it, you know. Uh, but everyone sent in these responses which were very moving and which actually, I mean, I, I would just be crying, you know, reading their texts. And so very much I also realized the power of, you know, looking back, of, of sharing this. It is not only my loss or, you know, or like as we are doing today again, you know, um, so uh, that there is a sense of, you know, 
uh, a sense that percolates across citizens, you know. Uh, and, um, and so it became a kind of like an archive of, you know, responses, uh, some commenting directly on the pictures. Under the picture, as you see, you have the factual caption, which is what, you know, uh, appeared in the mainstream publication when it was published. On the left, you have the interpretation or, you know, the response or the very tangential kind of comment, you know. Uh, which which an artist may have made, and um, and then then really after 2014, I thought that was it. But it just kept growing. It developed a life of its own. Stories kept coming in. You know, uh, so many friends then continued to send. You know, and in the last iteration in 2020, actually, uh, you know, uh, there have again been additions by. Uh, you know, the writer Amitabh Bhagchi by Arundhiti Roy, by these wonderful drawings, you know, by Gagan Singh, who's a, a really brilliant artist and who had his own experience, you know, uh, as a child, um, you know, in their neighborhood when, you know, the mobs were coming and he was in Delhi very much. He said he drew in notebooks, but he never kept the drawings. And so the last few years I was saying to him, do you ever, you know, want to say, and then suddenly last year he said, you know, actually I don't have those drawings, but I have other drawings which, you know, and, and I finally feel I can, you know, I, I want to express and it would be a kind of catharsis and I have, and so there are these very powerful drawings, you know, which now also go through, um, go through the, the text and the images, you know. And at some point, so many students started writing to me because the notebook started traveling even out of, you know, someone said we want to, uh, I mean, the, the, you know, the one thing perhaps I didn't mention is that they were designed to be printed on photocopy A4 paper. So it is printed, anyone can print it. It's a free notebook on the web. You can print it out like this on a A4 sheet you fold it over and you staple it and you have a book. So it's actually free dissemination and it's on my website as well as it's been on Kafila and it's been on other websites, you know, and uh, scroll and other people, you know, and then uh, so anyone can download, you know, say the poet, uh, you know, uh, Ajmer Rode, you know, he in Canada, like he, he printed out a bunch and he said, I want to distribute them. Anyone, anywhere, you know, spontaneously can, it, it belongs to everyone, you know, in that sense. And so, um, so, uh, so it has just kept growing. And then students started writing to me. And I realized that actually, you know, uh, and they would say, what should we read about? And I suddenly realized this is actually, you know, so many years ago now, 25, there's a generation for whom, like they said, we heard with, from our grandparents, but we don't really know, you know, enough about it. And I would have to recommend things for them to read. And, and so then I started to make a bibliography. And perhaps Manminda can show, you know, I did quite a lot of research and, and you know, all your work in, you know, including the Singh twins and so on. I tried to make a bibliography of all the people who have written uh, or done something on 84, uh, which is again available on, you know, my website uh, so that if anyone, you know, is looking is doing research and they are looking for resources, they can just uh, go here. And every few years again, I try and update it. So, uh, and, and you know, as I've always said, this is like my email is there. Uh, I really look, people often email me links of things to add, you know. So the archive now continues to grow and there are just various iterations of it, you know, mm -hmm. so. So that's a little bit, but it's very much a collective endeavor. It's become a kind of archive. Uh, it's, you know, and it's, it's, gone, it's gone outside the Sikh community to friends, you know, uh, who have expressed very powerful solidarity through their writing, through, you know, through their words and um, drawing, uh, you know. Um, at the end, there's a drawing, there's a wonderful drawing in the end of the notebook by a great Adivasi artist, you know. And uh, he he was telling me a story, and you know here you see this Venkat Singh Sham. Mm -hmm. He actually, you know, he so he's a uh, 
he he was telling me the story of how he had you know he came across some people you know who um, were driving trucks and how one of those truckers cut his head off and because there were mobs moving very violently uh, through you know i think he was in a village in madhya pradesh you know yeah. somewhere traveling so i said would you consider contributing to the notebooks and he said yes i would i will make a drawing you know yeah. Yeah. and so he has this was his response you know uh, so so there's all kinds of contributions in here and and really as like i just feel i'm in some ways the facilitator but the project is now much larger than myself right thank you so much uh, for telling us about that ms gillan it's such a such an ingenious collective collaborative project like you're explaining and it's this really rich resource and archive and it's living and breathing right because you're saying that you're constantly adding to it and getting other people to add to it and so important what you're doing uh, in terms of disseminating the work not just within the community but trying to engage larger audiences in india and elsewhere and it's so great that people are contributing and you sort of getting them to to narrate their experiences or express it in non narrative forms like these paintings so it's great and like we said before uh, like i said before um the link to ms gill's website is here and you can look up the notebooks there and it's just such a wonderful resource for all of us thank you uh so i'm going to ask uh, the saint twins next uh, to tell us about their iconic painting i believe anyone who knows even if they don't know much about 1984 i think people have encountered your painting in some form or another you know it's it's on the cover of books you know people whenever they talk about 1984 they evoke it in various ways so we'd love for you to uh, talk us through some important aspects of the painting and i think we can do a screen share again yeah. Sure. Well, um, I guess to start with, uh, I think a lot of people don't realise is that we actually had did two versions of our response to the events of 84. And um, the very first one was really just a gut reaction. It was a, a personal protest um, against the event in itself. So the image on the left is uh, a very small work. It's probably about 7 by 11 inches. And as we mentioned before, we were at school when 1984 events happened. And this was our immediate gut reaction. We wanted to really counter uh, what we felt was not being told through the media, namely the main focus being the loss of innocent lives. Uh, you, know, you know, people caught in the crossfire, innocent pilgrims who were there, you know, just paying homage on, on the day that the, the Indian army, uh, well, over several days, that the army uh, invaded the temple. So it really focuses on that human, you know, the human cost of that political event. Um, and I guess at that time, because we were at school, we weren't really um, exhibiting our work. We hadn't even thought of becoming professional artists. So this little piece was very much a kind of personal act of defiance. It was our way of venting that anger and that frustration and trying to put the record straight it's visually somehow. Uh, it wasn't until about 1999 that we then found uh, an opportunity to really tell what we felt was the hidden story of 84, you know, the story from the... Not even, I wouldn't even say the sick perspective. I would like to say that from a, 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 a more balanced, truer perspective, um, where we had this opportunity with our first touring show in the UK to create a much larger piece, which is the work that you see on the right of the screen there. Um, and the starting point again was looking at the human cost. So it's focusing very much on the pilgrims that were gathered there. Uh, it's also showing, um, trying to counter that propaganda that was being banded around at the time so a little detail so slide two and three perhaps we could have a look at the close-ups of, of those areas of the artwork so slide two the top left hand corner a lot, lot of you know may not you may miss it if you don't actually you know look at the artwork closely enough to see it but it's showing a group of uh, journalists who are blindfolded um, so obviously it was a symbolic way of showing how the media in our eyes was not reporting what they were seeing or what was Take, actually taking place well they weren't being allowed to report well, well, because, because of the, the blackout well yeah yeah and then the next slide after that was again it's just a, a close-up of uh, some of the of the crowd scene which was focusing on you know everyday pilgrims uh and pilgrims from all around the world so for example you have the, the little boy at the front he's got the manchester united t-shirt on it but these weren't you know people from all over the world and it was representing also not just sick pilgrims uh, to the Hermandir side, but also Muslims and Hindus, you know, people from different faiths as well within the crowd scene. 
and it was really trying to just emphasize that these were, you know, the, the, the official story was the, the government went in to flush the Hermandas out from these uh, so-called alleged terrorists. And what we were trying to say is, well, no, actually the real victims were these innocent people, everyday people, men, women, children. And again, basing these images on a lot of the reports that we read, um, you know, between 84 and, and 99 when our exhibition took place and trying to make the point that this, particularly with the figure of the young boy that represents the diaspora Sikh community, that this could have been anyone, it could have been us. We could have been visiting from under side that year and it, it, that could have been us. These were just ordinary people. They didn't you know, deserve to be inflicted with this atrocity perpetrated by the government. Um, there are other details within the work. If we could just move to the next image, which addresses, please, which addresses one of the other things that we were trying to show with this work. And that was why Six felt aggrieved by what had happened. It seemed to us at the time that no, nobody really understood or wanted to understand the, the hurt, perspective, yeah. why we felt so aggrieved, why we felt so hurt. And especially in light of, um, you know, the emphasis in the media, it seemed to us about six being anti-patriotic, anti-Indian terrorists. This little detail here says, no, we six as a community have always been patriotic. You know, we, we've always put our heads above the parapet when, whenever we've been needed to defend India. We have an image here of Guru Deng Bahadurji, severed head on a, on a platter being offered to India at a time during uh, Mughal persecution where he was defending the rights of religious freedom, not necessarily of Sikhs, but of, of non-Sikhs. And then next to him, you have uh, in a symbolically severed head of, of, of Bhagat Singh, who is similarly uh, a figure who was prominent in India's um, independence movement. And I know there's some controversy about was Bhagat Singh a Sikh or not a Sikh, but the point is that Sikhs identify with Bhagat Singh as being from their community and they, he is recognised within our community as having made a sacrifice along with so many other Sikhs for India's uh, freedom. And if we move to the next image, similarly, there are other images pertaining to the um, Sikh contribution to that freedom movement through the monument here of the, the Flame of Amritsar, the monument to those who were killed during the Jalawana Bagh. Uh, attack in 1919. Um, then the next image in itself, another poignant detail of the artwork, uh, if we may move on, is actually showing a close-up of a detail from the left-hand side of the artwork. And it shows Indira Gandhi, you know, riding into Hermanda Saab complex on a tank. Of course, she wasn't actually there. But as artists, you know, we have the, the benefit of artistic license and we use um, symbolic imagery to project the narratives that we want to explore through our work. Um, and she's shown as this multi-headed political demon. She's represented mm -hmm. alongside the faces of Margaret Thatcher, Churchill and Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. I think you can see on the next slide a close-up of that particular detail just to give you, yeah. So the artwork was also not just about our experience of six. We were trying to put that horrific event within the context of global politics. And I guess it was a personal message too, because I have to confess that up to that point, up till 1984, as naive teenagers, I think we felt that India was some kind of beacon of good practice when it came to politics. And when the Indian government, Indra Gandhi, who we had come to admire up until that point as a strong female political leader of India, uh, that vision was shattered. You know, we suddenly realised that actually, you know, politicians are the same wherever they come from when it comes to power, greed, ambition, um, you know, collateral damage. People are just collateral damage. It doesn't matter which country you come from, how squeaky, uh, squeaky clean a political leader may appear to be or a country may appear to be uh, at some point or other it has blackened its hands with some kind of atrocity where power uh, dominates the interests of, the, of you know, the people that they govern or people that they don't govern in many instances so this little image in the corner was really making the story of uh, the sixth story of 1984 a global, a global story. story something about you know universal comment about the state political of politics corruption. in the world that we live in today and political corruption in the world that we live in today and there are other details, if we may move on uh, to the next image, that uh, again put the 84 event in our minds. We were trying to, um, context I guess, make, yeah, make connections between what had happened in 84 and what had happened you know, previously in Sikh history. And this little detail of um, Bhagat Singh Shaheed, Baba Deep Singh, who, sorry, Baba Deep Singh Ji, who of course gave his head in defense of. Um, you know, defending the, des the desecration of Hermandas Saab against the Afghan invaders of India back in the days of, of the Mughals. Um, it occurred to us that 84, you know, it's not the first time this has happened to the Sikhs. It, to us, 84 seemed to be the Indian government trying to put the Sikhs in their place, 
trying to teach them a lesson of some kind. By attacking and, the heart of the faith. Yeah, and throughout yeah. history, that had always been done to the Sikhs by attacking the heart of their faith, from underside. So this figure was making that connection between, you know, the things that have been committed in the past and the things that are continuing to be committed against the Sikh community in the present. There's also details, if we may move on uh, to the next image, quite a few mm. symbolic imagery uh, within the artwork. So, for example, uh, I mean, ev everything has a, a significance within, a, within, a, within the work and the, you know, the clouds there, you know, the red sky and the, the kind of turmoil of the clouds reflect the turmoil of the event itself. Um, in the water, which is, uh, you know, you have lotuses which represent kind of purity. So, again, it was a reference to the, the, the kind of innocence, if you like, of, of those that lost their lives uh, during the, you know, the, the cross, caught in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, all the soldiers, they have no eyes. Um, you know, they say that the eyes are the window to the soul. So this idea of the, um, the kind soulless. of army being this soulless machine, if you like, doing the bidding of, of the, the government. Um, Even uh, sometimes against their own conscience. Yeah, you know, this acting on orders. orders yeah. and, uh, kind of a statement about... Uh, you know the, the nature of armies, the nature of, of the you know the soldiers' work, if you like. Yeah, and of course, going back to slide one again, the main image. You know, the idea that the the, the desecration being reflected by this uh, kind of red area, this blood flowing into the the sacred uh, tank uh, of Harmanda Sahib, again reflecting what we felt had not been adequately um, told through the press about, yeah. about the desecration, the damage, and and the loss of life. I mean, there's many more, there's much more we could say, but I think that's the platform. kind of poignant points. Thank you so much. And it, it really, it's, it's, it's such a privilege, uh, you know, uh, this is a wrong word to use and an inappropriate word to use, but really it's such a treat really for, for, uh, for us to have you do such a close reading of the painting and really break it down and explain the various components, uh, you know, just like with all your work, you know, you sort of go back and there's so much more to uh, to understand and interpret every time you go back to the notebooks, the painting, uh, uh, Mr. Singh's book. Uh, but there's again, you're doing so much, you're making the invisible visible, connecting it with larger global politics, but also telling the story of 1984 as part of a longer story of six. And um, one of the stories in Mr. Singh's book, which is the title story, Night of Restless Spirits, I think that's what he tries to do as well, sort of situate 1984 as part of, you know, a longer history uh, and uh, sort of, you know, connecting the past, present and future. So Mr. Singh, it'll be great if you can read. It's up to you. You can read um, a segment of any one of your stories for us. That'll be great. And if you want to talk a little bit about it after you're done reading, that'll be wonderful. Thank you. I'll be delighted to. Uh, I was actually going to read an excerpt from the title, uh, the first story in the collection, Paji, uh, which is set in the aftermath of Mrs. Gandhi's assassination. Uh, but this uh, wonderful segment and, uh, you know, sort of revisiting the art of the Saint Twins uh, it really inspires me to go to the title story because, as you very correctly observed, Shruti, uh, the themes are very, very similar. So let me just jump to that. If my device will cooperate. Gosh, it's refusing to bear with me. I'm traveling, so I didn't have a physical copy of my book with me. No worries. So, Take your time. Second, please. So I'll pick it up uh, from a few paragraphs into the story. What is, what is left of Hukam Singh lies by him, between him and the marble wall richly adorned in red. Hukam Singh's hands are tied behind his back with his saffron case key. The last of the old school grand ragis he lives and breathes rags and gurbani. His voice is old and cracked, and it trembles, but every note is crystal clear 
and touches the basest of hearts. Hukum Singh's last performance is over, and what a performance. His Jodidar, who accompanies him on the tabla, has fled, but the LMGs that the Jawans carry sound like a perfectly tuned tabla. That fool of a Jodidar could never play the Tiharwa right. He should have been here to listen to the soldiers. Hukum Singh's last performance is unusual. There is no Mangla Charan and no Alap today. There is no time spent tuning the Tanpuras and the Tabla. And instead of sitting down and whispering in undertones, the Sangat is uncharacteristically quiet and calm. And their heads are bare. Such disrespect. Their hands are folded tightly folded, but behind their backs, they look scared. The perfectly timed kehrwa begins on the guns, and in an unbecoming and ungainly display, the sangha twitches and jerkily dances to the beat. And then Hukam Singh's voice joins in joyous celebration of the rhythm. His voice soars to the sky in a wonderful new rag, rising and falling in ornate gamak embellished thongs effortless, effortlessly spanning tens of octaves, expanding until the Gurdwara, then the village, and then the entire Punjab echoes the sound of the furious melody crafted so carefully by the widow and her gleeful Kehrwa founding divisions. No longer but a, a Sikh, but now a Sufi dancing in agony and ecstasy as each beat pierces his enormous body that is now a magnet that sucks in their molten lead and the rag comes out stronger and louder through every new mouth. It stops as suddenly as it begins. The last few notes bubble out of Hukum Singh's body and drip onto the old man's face the Sangat has stopped its undignified, jerky dance and is silent, sleeping, sated. The widow's musicians have taken their music and left, searching for another audience. Baba Fateh Singh wipes the pool forming before his eyes, but there is still a haze before him, making him squint. He groans as he somehow manages to raise his head a few inches off the ground. Hukum Singh's lifeless face has a grimace frozen on it, as if he died in the middle of a particularly intricate movement in the rag. So this story references the Dukh Nevadan Sahib massacre, which was not reported on at that time, but news of that sort of filtered through. Uh, from a personal level, uh, the very, so this is one of the earliest stories that I'd written. Kultar's Mind was the first piece. Then this one was written with a couple of others. And then the others were written after a hiatus of almost 30 years. Uh, this particular story sort of echoes a couple of my literary influences. Uh, there's a homage buried in there to Salman Rushdie's Midnight Children that fans of that book will recognize. And then, of course, uh, the one work that informed the writing of this story most significantly was Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, uh, in, in which he powerfully makes the point that as terrible a tragedy such a massacre is, the effacing of such a massacre from collective memory is a tragedy that is equally large or even possibly larger. And then, of course, uh, you know, we didn't get to this part in the reading, but uh, by bringing in the parallels between Jalliyamala Bagh and Sri Hermandar Sahib, uh, sorry, Dukhnabad and Sahib, where ironically, this old man perishes to you know, in, made in India bullets when, as a young child, he had survived the bullets of the British Raj 
during the Chalayamala Bagh massacre. So that's the nature of this collection of stories. A few things were important to me when I set out to particularly write the later stories and finish this book. Uh, terrible things happen to six, quote, is obviously an important theme that runs through this collection. But it's very important to understand that the stories of six suffering are not the only stories that need to be told. Other stories needed to be told as well, the stories of non six who placed themselves in harm's way to save sick bodies, people who jeopardized their careers to save lives, all of those stories needed to be told as well. And hence, this collection then tries to take a somewhat more nuanced view of 1984 and really tries to examine it from many, many different angles. Right. Thank you so much. And I've had the good fortune of, of reading uh, the book. And uh, really, it is it is a, a very nuanced, complex hybrid of fact and fiction, but also, like Mr. Singh is saying, expanding the scope of the story of 1984. Of course, the trauma and suffering suffered by six, but also sort of taking it beyond the community. And again, I think it's, it's a theme that uh, seems to be uh, you know that that's common to all the work that sh all of you are doing and again you can see in chat you can see the link to mr singh's book right there and uh there are several events and readings that are planned uh, unfortunately because of covid um you know, it's not quite as it could have been, but uh, Mr. Singh has been doing online uh, talks and panels, and uh, you know, you uh, there's a list right there if you're if you'd like to have a look. Um, so the next question I have, uh, you've addressed this in in various ways in talking about your work already, um, and it might be abstract to some extent. So you know, whatever comes to mind is okay. But as I said earlier. Uh, trauma is something that defies coherent language and violent experiences are hard to express, uh, you know, both in words or non-narrative forms. And so what I'd like to ask uh, each one of you is how the various media you use, uh, you know, photography in Ms. Gill's case, paintings for the sick twin, uh, Singh twins and uh, literature and writing for Mr. Singh, how do you think they help us formulate a language for violence and trauma? So, Ms. Gill, if we can start with you, can you offer some reflections on how photography might help us make sense of trauma and the afterlife of violence? What might it be about the genre in, in particular? So, I think, you know, photography per se can also be problematic. Because, for instance, when I first went in with Tehelka, you know, a lot of people in Tilak Vihar and rightfully so were quite upset with the media because they felt, you know, people only came in that particular time, you know, in the run up to November 1st. And, um, and then after that, they were forgotten. And, you know, so people descending in this way, you know, um, uh, with their cameras and so on. Uh, and, and so, you know, that of course is problematic and again also bothered me and I felt um, you know uh, so in consult I felt how how must I address but for me it was very important to keep consulting the people and actually you know uh, to let them suggest what what might be possible and so for instance we staged a picture you know of all the women who organized it and then I actually went back with that picture and I said, look, this is what I did. And, you know, and so then we ended up for four weeks, you know, running Tehelka every week had that uh, center, you know, center spread. And so, so, I mean, I think for trauma, I think, you know, the conversation is essential because, um, I mean, for one, if we never address what happened, you know, and, and this was, there's the Nelly massacre, but, you know, after the Nelly massacre, this is like one of, you know, um, uh, and, and it's not an honor of any kind. It's, it's a terrible, you know, uh, truth that this is one of the first sort of, you know, massacres, pogroms in which the state had a role to play and, you know, which was, which has actually been recognized now as a pogrom and uh, not a riot because there was no, you know, 
it was it was not two sided in that sense so so i think the conversation is really key and how you know and that we talk about it that we don't forget that we remember and of course that we always privilege in this conversation those who've actually had the experience you know so in that sense i very much feel i have to you know my role is very much to try and listen to people who've had the experience and uh and then perhaps to open it out you know among other friends and to keep raising questions i think the one thing art can do uh perhaps is that we we keep it in the space where it's as much a question for me as you know uh accusing i mean of course we stand against power and you know there are those who must be held accountable and there are you know questions of justice and all that but it's also about turning you know the the lens on to one own one's own self and one's own you know accountability in various ways all the time reflecting on that you know and i think artists sometimes we can perhaps open up the space so that we end with more questions perhaps than answers but we continue to have have that conversation you know and we and we don't forget thank you so much yeah and that's such a uh, such an important and such a good point that you raise about you know sort of um it's you know there there are there are more questions and answers in this world anyway but you know just sort of living with these questions and uh and and becoming more introspective and reflexive so instead of you're sort of creating the space to to think more about this rather than necessarily offering answers here right there are no easy answers anyway um thank you so much for sharing that uh so uh saint twins can i talk about can i ask you about um painting an artwork then how do you think it helps formulate a language for again the unspeakable which is you know the kind of events that 1984 were so yeah well i think from our own perspective in, in the style that we work in is a very it's a visual style basically our commun we communicate through imagery through images rather than text or or word and i think the power of that is that it has the um the ability to connect people from different backgrounds you know you don't have to speak english or hindi or french or whatever to understand mm -hmm. uh, or interpret um the message that's coming through the artwork everybody can relate to visual image imagery and i think our work has always been you know hallmarked by a very kind of decorative detailed style which we feel helps to draw people in to the narrative and it's a kind of soft way if you like if i can use that term of drawing people into looking at uh the traumatic <laughs> themes that might otherwise be very difficult to uh kind of confront or 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 to see um you know if you just kind of with more graphic style images so you know our work it draws people in and we let them explore the work and hopefully then they will come across you know certain details that then they you know the, the realization i guess that it's it's not a beautiful picture it might be beautiful aesthetically but it's you know the message it has is not so beautiful at all and i think that's the power of, of art really mm -hmm. but it's also so arts in general is a me yeah. medium that's multi sensory so you know whether it's music or or painting or theatre um yeah. it can connect with people in different ways in a very accessible way um and right. different age groups too yeah different age yeah. groups different backgrounds but also it has the ability like with our no, art, this particular that. artwork for example it has the ability to tell a story uh multiple narratives within one plane you don't have to turn the page you know to see the next part of the story or a different dimension to that story you don't have to wait for someone to stop speaking before you get to hear the next bit with the visuals of art that you can create multiple narratives just within that one canvas and i think that can be a very powerful thing because it gives people the option to um, absorb a lot of information within you know minutes of looking or seconds of looking at that 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 information but also to compare the information that they're seeing so very often maybe um not so much within this work but you know the way that artists can utilize imagery and symbolism to to convey different levels of interpretation different narratives um and and sometimes opposite perspectives and narratives as well which helps to create debate around a particular theme i think that's the power and strength of art as well right 
Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. I mean, in that one single image, there is so much going on and you sort of talked us through some aspects of it. Um, and it's certainly, uh, you know, Cynthia Mahmood is an anthropologist who's written about um, 1984. She did work with Sikh militants and she talks about how a lot of Sikh homes have what uh, she calls massacre art. Um, your, your painting sort of it, it's sort of that, that, but it's much more than that because, like you're saying, it's it's much more palatable in many ways. It's still, you know, a very complex, difficult, traumatic set of events. But it's sort of, you know, the medium in which you're presenting it, and aesthetically, it's visually the colors, and you know, it's just so vivid. Mm -hmm. Sort of really draws you in. Um, but yeah, th th thanks so much for sharing that. Um, and uh, Mr. Singh, I'm going to ask you the same question. So to what extent do you think writing and literature help us in finding a language for trauma and suffering? And also maybe offer some thoughts on the relationship between fact and fiction in writing about 1984. A counter to the selective amnesia of official histories. That was uh, Urvashi Battaglia's response to the Night of the Restless Spirits. And I think that it uh, very aptly describes a lot of work in this genre in general. Partition. So much has been written about partition. You know, all of us were born after the events. I've engaged with a lot of writing about partition, but nothing helped me understand the sheer horrors of those times than Sardar Kushram Singh's very slim novel, Train to Pakistan. You know, no you know, tomes chock full of statistics or you know, real life stories could have the same effect on you as Train to Pakistan or uh, Goriji had referred to Obar Teik Singh uh, Tanda Ghosht by Salat Hassan Manto. So when there are certain truths that the powers that rule us don't want to be told, that's when fiction in particular becomes tremendously, tremendously important. I'll just share a tiny personal story with you. And, and the importance of this is not just that we are in pain, so we need to cry out in pain. It goes much beyond that. I go back several years. We have presented Kutar's Mind, the play, at the NCPA in Bombay. And later on, somebody sent me a blog post by a 16-year-old young woman who had attended the performance. So in her blog, she wrote, today I went to the NCP to see a play. It was performed by American actors. I was shocked. I was tremendously disturbed because it was very powerful, but above all, I was angry. I was angry because I never knew that something like this had happened to my countrymen in my country. I never want anything like this to ever happen to anyone ever again. That's the role of literature in this context, because history books will Never, history books written in India will never have references to 1984. We know that the Congress party that was culpable, obviously, will never let the story be told. Of course, the Congress doesn't rule India, the BJP does. The BJP is not going to be any more forthcoming because if a conversation about 1984 begins, right on its heels comes a conversation about Godra. So for that reason, writing about these events is tremendously important. Uh, the link between fiction and reality is a very good question that you asked. Uh, you know, Amitav Ghosh has written a very you know, a brilliant essay, really, about his experience in 1984 and his temerity, really, in terms of writing about 1984. He talks about the responsibility of a writer. Uh, I agree with a lot of what he has to say, but my view is a little different. I feel no burden in talking about 1984. I feel no burden in naming names, in assigning blame, in being very, very specific. 
I think that it's my job to do that as a writer. I mean, I have to go back to the paintings. Uh, that image of Indira Gandhi as a multi-headed monster flanked by Margaret Thatcher, you know, if you see that image once, you're never going to forget it for the rest of your life. So I feel that it's important to write with sincerity. It's important to write with honesty. But beyond that, it's fair game. You know, we can be as blunt as we want to. And I would argue that there's a need for us to be very blunt and very specific. Right. And you suddenly, I mean, you do that in, in Night of the Restless Spirits and all the stories. It's, it's you know, you really blur a fact and fiction. It's, it's like I said, it's a complex hybrid and you're really able to, um, you know, in, in some ways, like we've, I've been saying, it's just so hard to find language to express the unspeakable. But, you know, in, in sort of fictionalizing, you're also able to narrate the, the story of the community and, like you were saying, non six as well. Um, I'd invite, um, you know, I know we have a few audience questions already, but I, I really hope that more people will share their questions. I'd like to move on to that very soon. Um, I'll ask, hopefully, my my last question, and then we, I'll be able to open this up to audience questions. Um, but I just want to maybe uh, ask you about the reactions to your work. Uh, if you've, especially if you've experienced, this is a difficult topic to work on, and it continues to be controversial within the community and outside. So I was wondering if you've encountered any kind of resistance from, from, from community members, even maybe family, friends, larger society in doing this kind of work. And if you want to talk about that and how that makes you think and feel about your projects, engage with your projects. Um, I'll, I'll start with Ms. Gill again. Um. I wouldn't say resistance, uh, Shruti, to be, to be honest, as I was mentioning earlier, in fact, it has kept growing and, you know, it has found legs and it's found its own kind of life, uh, which makes me think, you know, uh, that, of course, it is about something much larger than, uh, than, than me or, you know, anything I might have been trying to say. So... So in that sense, I think, and in fact, I think there is this urge for people to talk about it. So if anything, you know, there's been that kind of like suddenly people even that I meet somewhere or they say, you know, I have a story and I would like to, you know, I would like to share, I'd like to contribute. So it's actually kind of opened a kind of uh, a floodgate, you know, uh, in that sense, there's a lot which and and people feeling that they can write you know uh and share for the bibliography so in that sense yeah i think maybe people you know who are looking or or so many people have had this experience you know and including again as uh you know uh Sarpriji was saying you know the uh, talking also of non six mm. you know, uh so friends of mm -hmm. mine again, talking of all kinds of experiences that, you know, people have had and which have again found themselves into this book, very powerful, you know, uh, stories. So, so I think it really, yeah, it's a kind, you know, in some ways, perhaps uh, uh, just a kind of channel for people to also um, express. Yeah. That's so great. So you're you're actually opening up. In, so contrary to resistance, you're actually opening up a space for a conversation and a catalyst for for more people to share experiences. And you were saying earlier how school children are 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 now writing to you as well. So you're actually it's really interesting how it's it's contrary to resistance. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, uh, Sing twins, if you want to talk about the reactions to your painting, uh, you know, if you encountered, I mean, it's really you know, in some ways, it's, you know, it has acquired a great deal of fame, uh, I'm sure, over the years. But if you've encountered resistance as well uh, from family, from community, from the other people, and how does that make you think and feel about it? Actually, the painting has always received overwhelmingly positive responses in the sense of, um, well, First of all, to put it in context, where, whenever we exhibit our work, we make sure that this piece is a, a showcase piece 
because we feel so strongly about wanting to get this message out to wider communities. And most of our audiences are actually from non-Indian, never mind non-Sikh communities. So the, the positive responses we've had are across the board, um, predominantly white, white communities. And in fact, the only negative response that we've actually had, family again have been very supportive, no negativity or resistance from there. But the only um, hint that people have a problem with this artwork came through a publication which featured the work. It's a publication, Insights, New Insights into Sikh Art, which carries a full page image of this particular painting. And it's published by Marg Magazine, which traditionally, uh, I think I under, my understanding is that they give a copy of this uh, to every state um, offices, the official state offices throughout India. And Punjab was the only um, state not to accept a copy of the book on the basis that that image was in there. So it, that was an indication that, that this was obviously still a, a problematic um, or maybe subject. Or caused backlash. Or maybe they were worried that it might cause backlash for the people that were, you know, it was being presented to, to have this, this book with this image in, in their offices. Beyond that, as I say, it's, it's been very positive. And we've always tried, uh, I mean, this, this work was not really created for the community. It was initially created for non six because obviously we live in the diaspora and the majority of communities here, uh, firstly trying to correct our school friends and then beyond that, you know, the kind of wider British population. Um, but then as as time uh, went on, we did realise that this has to be an image for our own communities too, because so many of our young generation, as I think we've already mentioned before, didn't know anything about 1984. We were knowing about it and we assumed that, you know, the younger generations would also know, but there was no way of them to find out. Um, and then also trying to really push the boundary of how we get the message out there by, for example, um, if we could go to image 10, we uh, also translated this painted piece into the medium of film. And we created this, this short documentary. Um, so that's image 10, if you have a, a number there, thank you, uh, called um, 1984 and the Via Dolorosa Project. Now, the Via Dolorosa is the tradition within the Catholic faith. We both grew up uh, in a, a Catholic convent school, educated in a Catholic convent school. So we were drawing upon that um, very familiar experience, that very familiar imagery that we saw when we used to go to the school chapel of uh, imagery called the Stations of the Cross. And it's a series of images that depicts the suffering and humiliation of Christ towards the end of his, his life. And so what we wanted before to do, um, before his, just prior to his crucifixion, through this film, what we wanted to do was make um, a parallel between the suffering and hum humiliation of the six in 84, not just the storming of Hermandar Star, but also the programs that happened afterwards, and paralleling that with the, with the experience of, of Christ. Um, because what we wanted to try and do is project that story through the eyes of a faith which is much more widely understood in the wider world and to try and to gain, gain empathy, empathy from you know beyond the Sikh community for, for our story. And when this film was screened, um, actually at the Sikh Film Festival, first uh, in Canada, I think it was, it was actually a Christian member of the audience who came up afterwards response, in yeah. tears, who had actually responded and really connected with what had happened to our community because it was presented to her through obviously a subject that she herself was very familiar with. So um, I think perhaps we, we would have expected more backlash if we'd shown this work in India, but it's not a piece that's ever gone there. Mm. It's always predominantly been America, UK, and Europe. So maybe that yeah. response to that question yeah. is yet to be but answered I think, more fully. I, I think the only criticism outside of that we've had on the odd occasion is mm. people wanting to oh. know why Bindrawali isn't shown in the artwork. You know, where's that story? You know, that going back to the prop, you know propaganda that it was all about. You know, embedded so-called terrorists, blah blah blah, and. Um, and of course, our, our work is not about that side of the story. Our work is to counter. Everybody, you know, has heard about that side of the story. And our work is not really interested in putting that uh, perspective. perspective across. It was purely about countering and, and kind of, um, you know, making it a balanced response, if you like, to the whole event by showing the other side of, of that story. Right, absolutely. Thanks so much uh, for sharing that. And it's so wonderful that, you know, you've also been able to do this kind of interfaith cross-cultural, very inclusive uh, work. And I believe the film might be available online or I'm not, I'm not. There, sure. there, there was a, a festival. A festival. I think it may be if you search on YouTube, there's a festival showing films around uh, kind of human rights issues. Um, you can double check. Yeah, so double check and send the information. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Uh, and, and Mrs. Singh, how about you? Um, have you encountered uh, any kind of resistance and how does that make you, you know, how does that uh, shape how you approach your work? So I'll tell you a little story. Uh, after the Rutgers performance of Rupar's Mind, which you were, which you attended, we started thinking about taking it to India. And I went to Delhi. I met with uh, Dr. Uma Chakravarti, among others, uh, who, by the way, Goyji was very kind to give me a copy of your notebook. That's the first time when I encountered it. Uh, so um, when I came back and I started talking about taking Kupar's Mind of Play to India, my friends and well-wishers wanted to know if I were insane. Uh, you know, India is a democracy, of course, but it's a kind of democracy where very nasty things can happen to people who say or do things that the powerful don't like. Mm -hmm. I have to confess that my heart was in my mouth until the very last minute of our first performance in the Ashra Theater in Delhi, because 30 years after the fact, we were bringing this play about a topic which was taboo. I went there fearful. I was definitely fearful that I'm going to be accused of inciting the Sikhs to revenge. You know, people in the U.S. asked me, you know, why do you want to break up these things? 30 years have happened. People have moved on. So I have to confess that mm -hmm. I went there with a lot of trepidation. We went to Punjab. We went to Delhi. As expected, there was an emotional response from the audiences because almost every performance included people who had either survived or had been touched by the violence. So the emotional response was no accident. But I have to tell you that when we took the play to Mumbai and Chennai and Kolkata and Bangalore, I was very apprehensive. You know, how are people going to react? The audiences are going to be non sick mm -hmm. But I have to tell you, that I was humbled and maybe a little bit ashamed when I discovered that the response of the non-Sikh audiences was not a whit different from the response of the Sikh audiences. There was shock, there were tears, there was empathy. And if anything, my experience traveling in India with the play twice, what I learned from that is that no matter what the politicians say, and no matter what kinds of divisions politicians try to create, ultimately, our shared humanity, our common humanity, is very robust, and it's alive and well. So the response to all of my work on 1984 for me has been tremendously, tremendously heartening, because what it shows me over and over again is that people understand that sectarian violence is wrong and the cost is absolutely unacceptable and it needs to stop. So that should be encouragement, I feel, for anyone who wants to create art in this context. There's nothing to be afraid of. People can deal with the truth and they deal with it you know, very, very well and very, very effectively. Thank you so much. And really, that's that's just so uh, heartening. And I, I think also uh, uh, surprising for me because the way in which, you know, uh, the state has and the media has, again, constructed the narrative, it seems like it's something that people at large wouldn't necessarily want to engage with or have a particular opinion or feelings about it. And you didn't encounter that. And that's just so remarkable. And, and, and also, thanks for inviting more people to do to do this kind of work. I hope that all the work that all of you are doing inspires more people. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead, uh, Ms. Gilgia. Yeah. I just wanted to say, Shruti, that there are a couple of things, you know, I mean, one issue that I've sort of consistently, and again, this is more, I guess, an issue with the mainstream media, but I do think, you know, and questions of representation that they, you know, um, and I referred to it earlier, but this, this, this expression of what happened as riots, you know, over really a one-sided pogrom, mm. I think that is uh, very problematic. And so sometimes, 
you know, I, I mean, I think it has been a long and concerted effort in as much as we are speaking to, uh, you know, how uh, the kind of, you know, uh, of course, the, the, the kind of, you know, uh, real acceptance which has it has received from people. But there is also, if I was to think of resistance, there is, you know, um, those kinds of things I find disturbing when even now someone will say to me, you know, the, the riots, the 1984, or they'll put it in a text or, you know, and I will say to, absolutely. And, you know, in 2012, I think it was, or was it 14, but the, the Weiner Library in London, you know, um, for the Holocaust and genocide, and we organized and Uma Chakravarti was very much a part of it. Uh, you know, an exhibition, and they recognize 1984 as a genocide very much, you know. Uh, but in any case, we don't even need, you know, we don't need anyone else uh, telling us this. We know what happened. And so, so those kinds of things, you know, there is, I just feel there's so much work to be done in that sense. You know, the dominant discourse has been so powerful and you know, words are so important, how you frame things, um, you know. So, so yes, I, I find that as a kind of disturbing, you know, something that has to be addressed. Certainly, absolutely. The, the question of language and terminology and dismissing uh, the violence as riots, because it has a very particular connotation, the term. But uh, but even it's, and, and it's very interesting, even people who sort of seem to um, realize the gravity or the significance of the violence still continue to use that terminology uh, or framework and and you write that that's really uh, you know durable and persistent and there needs to be a way to kind of challenge that yeah uh, we're running out of time I know but I can see uh, at least a few questions so I'm going to try to get at least one or two uh, so Diditi from New Brunswick New Jersey has shared a question um, how does one understand one's place and belonging within a unit such as Indian society when the same unit has inflicted such pain and trauma and continue to be silent about it? Um, I believe, I think the question is about um, understanding uh, the Sikh community's place in Indian society, living, you know, having suffered uh, such violence and trauma. Uh, maybe what compels them to stay silent or how, you know, how do they engage with that silence? I'm not sure um, if any of you want to take up that question. I know, yeah, go ahead, uh, Mrs. Singh, yeah. So this is, uh, this is a very important question, particularly because uh, Sikri's, a lot of Sikri's audience is in the diaspora and it consists a lot of younger Sikhs. So this question is tremendously important now, it's important to understand that young Sikhs who have been born in the diaspora and who have no sort of relationship with India or Indian society do end up looking at all things India and Indian through the lens of 1984. How could they not? because we, their mentors, talk to them about 1984 because it's important to talk about 1984. Mm -hmm. So our conversations need to be tempered, nuanced, and very, very specific. So specifically addressing young Sikhs and the person who asked this question, I would say the first thing that you need to do is engage. And, you know, um, I'm exaggerating, but, you know, you're going to find that India and Indian society is not exclusively peopled by monsters. I'm being tongue in cheek here, you know, uh, because of the fact that, especially when there is no direct connection and your lens is primarily 1984, it's very easy to fall into that trap. I was born in India. I have many positive associations with India that balance my you know very sort of negative views about indian government and indian leaders as a result of 1984 and i felt that way i told you that i was ashamed when i found that the response of non-six was very very positive so to young six i would say 
it's important for us to understand who attacked us. Hindus didn't attack us. India didn't attack us. A very narrow political interest attacked us. Yes, you could say that society at large is culpable when it does nothing to stop these things. But you know what? Society tends to be apathetic. What did anybody in Delhi do when the students from the Jamia Millia University and the JNU were being attacked you know, a couple of years ago when we could see another 1984 in the making almost? This doesn't excuse anything. But what we have to understand is that we have to assign blame very, very specifically lest we fall into the trap of hatred. You know, if you'll humor me for 30 seconds, I will go back to the ethos of the Sikh gurus, which completely, you know, informs or should inform how we Sikhs think about 1984 and everything else. The gurus were unequivocal in their opposition to tyranny. They were also unequivocal when it came to the fight against injustice. The gurus suffered a lot, not just from a community perspective, but from a personal perspective. But I asked the question, did anything or any action that any of the gurus took, did it ever end up even in the neighborhood of hatred or revenge or a desire for revenge? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is unequivocally not. So that's how I feel we should look at our place to answer the question very, very directly. We should be uncompromising in our quest for justice. But at the same time, we have to avoid the pitfall of you know, stereotyping and hatred because that's what we suffered. We don't want to impose that on anyone else. Yeah. Go, yes. go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Sing twins first and maybe Ms. Gill after that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, separate G. I just wanted to um, kind of affiliate with what you said there in terms of our own work because one of the criticisms, which is something I slipped my mind when you asked that question about our artwork, some people do sometimes take it as an anti-Indian statement. And we're very clear as artists that, you know, we are we have a very deep love for India. We've been privileged to be born here, but we've been very privileged to have been able to visit India several times. And we feel a very strong cultural connection to India. And so the painting was never intended to be an anti-Indian statement. And I think that's one of the reasons why we wanted to make it very clear that it was a, essentially, when you boil it down, a statement about the universal nature of politics and political greed, which is why that figure in the bottom right is such a prominent part of the composition. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, Ms. Gill, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to also bring up, you know, the, the farmers that have been protesting now at the borders of Delhi. And, you know, uh, to me, it was so heartening and it remains so heartening to go there and to see that despite everything that has happened, they continue to make and serve langar you know, and to all the people who come, you know, uh, it's not just Sikhs, but to all the people from the neighboring areas, you know, a lot of which are like um, uh, are fairly destitute. And so all kinds of people come. And uh, and so every time I you know, would just come back inspired and think that actually the people who are really at the vanguard, the people who actually are suffering the brunt of all, you know, much closer to you know, who, who are feeling, you know, even the brunt of neoliberal economics and all of that much closer, uh, you know, how they are able to kind of transform this and to be so generous and, um, yeah, and it's just like, do your worst, you know, uh, but here, uh, have some langar. And so that response, I mean, to me, that's a really powerful gesture. In fact, a kind of, uh, you know, artistic, a, a wonderful performative gesture which speaks uh, more than you know any words in that sense 
thanks so much for bringing that up, Ms. Gilia, and for you know reminding us of of the farmers and and their continuing protests, and and all of you for talking about the difference between resisting resisting the state and and you know the the more sort of you know regular citizens and common people and how they think and feel about. 1984 and other such kinds of events, because that boundary making has really been politicized between the boundary between us and them. And you're really actually trying to transcend and look beyond that. And I'm so grateful uh, for all your work. And I'm so grateful for, you know, uh, the chance to talk to you today. We've run out of time. Uh, but really, my heartfelt thanks to you and for uh, my thanks to the audience, of course. I know that I'm going to continue to learn from and think with your, you know, important representations of 1984. And I really hope that more people across the world will engage with your work, especially after this webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, Manvinder, back to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to wrap things up for us today. Uh, on behalf of Sikri, I thank all of today's wonderful panelists for this insightful conversation. I was so delighted to be able to hear uh, the various ways in which the events of 1984 have been shared and interpreted by all of you. Uh, it was so powerful to be able to think with you all, to experience and embody and be unsettled um, by these events with you and with what others have shared with you. So again, I just want to reiterate, thank you to our panelists, to our wonderful moderator, and to all of those who have joined us this morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time zone you're in. As always, a recording of this webinar will be available within 24 hours. And lastly, don't forget to tune into the SICCAST, a podcast produced by SICRI, where we explore the various issues and events affecting six worldwide. Thank you for joining in. Today's webinar will be ending now. Vaigujika Kalsa, Vaigujiki Fateh.